Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and this is Chemistry Essentials video 37. It's on the rate constant. Before you watch this video, make sure you've watched the video. It's 37 on the rate law. If you don't know what a first, second, zero order reaction is, make sure you watch that video so you know what I'm talking about. But here's our rate law right here. So in our rate law, the M and the N, and there can be more exponents than that, is going to tell us the reaction order. In other words, is A proceeding at a second order reaction and B at a zero order reaction? So that's going to be in the exponent. Uh, in here we're going to get the concentration, so this would be the concentration of reactant A and B. But remember, if we have a really big reaction, we could have more of these reactants. And then finally we have reaction rate, which is going to be how fast this reaction is proceeding. So if we get rid of all those things, what we're left with is K. And so what is K? It's going to be this rate constant. And so the first thing you should understand about that rate constant is that it's not constant. It's dependent upon things like temperature and the presence of a catalyst. But really you want to understand what rate constant is and how it can be calculated. And so if we look at the rate law, the rate law is going to contain a constant. And we'll call that K. And that K is measurable. In other words, we can gather a bunch of experimental data. We can look at it and we can work backwards to figure out what K is. A really easy way to do that in AP Chemistry is to measure the reaction uh, rate over time and then use that to figure out K. Um, there's going to be huge variability in K. In every reaction we're going to have different Ks and you can't figure out what it is just looking at the equation so we have to measure that. Why is there so much variation? There's so much variation in our chemical reactions or the mechanisms of that and we'll talk about that in the next video. Also you should understand that K is not constant. It's going to de be dependent upon things like temperature and the presence of a catalyst. And then finally, if we're looking at the order of reaction, especially in a first order reaction, there's a cool relationship between the half-life and K. In other words, they're going to be both independent of concentration, so it's really easy to figure out. Once we have the rate, we can figure out the half-life. And so here's a simple relationship between the two. And a great example of the half-life then is going to be radioactive decay. And I think visually when I show it to you, it'll make sense. And so the first thing you should understand is that K is going to have wide variability. This is somebody's research paper. And before they get to the actual chemistry, they had to publish all of the rate constants that they'd figured out in all of their experiments. And if you look at all these numbers, they're incredibly variable. And the reason we have so much vari variation in K is that we have so much variation in reactions. We can't simply look at the reaction itself and figure out what K is going to be. We have to experimentally measure that in the laboratory. Also the rate constant is not constant. So temperature clearly is going to affect the rate constant. And also things like catalysts. We'll talk more about that in later videos. But catalysts can speed up a reaction. And so the catalyst found in, this is a cutout of a catalytic converter in a car. Uh, and what those are really doing are speeding up the reaction and getting rid of some of the really nasty stuff that we uh, is produced in an internal combustion engine. And so if we look at the rate constant, and now we're talking about a first order reaction, right here we have uh, radioactive decay. And so let's look at this. On the left side, we have fewer molecules that we do on the right side, but let's just watch it occur in a first order reaction. And so as this reaction goes, you can see a lot of the reactants are being consumed right at the beginning, but eventually it kind of drops off that rate at which they're being consumed. And so let's watch that again. So if we look at it again, a lot of reactants are being consumed at the beginning, but then it's kind of falling off as we go. And so if we were to look at the, the ones over here on the left, let's go back. How many did we have at the beginning? We have 16. And now let me kind of move it forward and let's try to find the half-life. So we had 16 there. And now we've got eight. And so we've got half of them during that given period of time. But now if we watch during the next period of time, now we're going from eight down to four, and then from four down to two. And you can see that it's taking about one half-life each time. Now why is it not exactly one, two, and three up here? It's because we have a very small sample size. If I were to count all of these on the left, it's be more specific. Okay, so let's get to what that looks like graphically. And so what is half-life? Half-life is T sub 1 half. It's going to be the amount of time it takes for half of the reactants to be consumed. And so this is what a curve of radioactive decay would look like. And so if I draw that graphically, this box is showing that 50% of the reactants that we had right here are being consumed. And if we look down on the bottom, let's say this takes one year. Now this doesn't always have to be one year. It could be 
um, you know, thousands or millions of years for the half-life. But if we look at that step, and then we look at the next half-life, now we're going from 50 down to 25. And so what we're doing is consuming half of the reactants that we had left. You can see that as we do it again, that each of these half-lives is going to be constant. And so in a first order reaction, all of the half-lives are going to be constant. And so rate, or excuse me, K and half-life have these cool relationships. First thing is that both of them are independent of the concentration. The K is going to remain constant and the half-life is going to remain constant. And also we can use K once we've calculated it to figure out half-life or vice versa. There's a direct inversely proportional relationship between these two. And so it's easier to kind of now look at a zero order and then a second order reaction. So what would be the half-life of this one? Well, again, we're going to consume half of it. And so this would be during a given period of time in a zero order reaction. Look how long the half-life is. But now we're going to go to a smaller half-life and then even a smaller let. And so even then a smaller yet. And so in a zero order reaction, you can see that the half-life is getting smaller. Or if we look at a second order reaction, let's look at that first half-life. It's really, really short. Next one's longer, next one's even longer yet. And so you can tell just looking at a graph and figuring out the half-life, is this a zero order, second order, or if it's exactly the same in each one, then it's going to be a half-life or a first order reaction. And so can you connect the half-life of a reaction to the rate constant in a first order reaction? Again, they're both going to be constant. We can use this equation to figure it out, and I hope that was helpful.